and welcome to another evening of frank conversation here on hard copy i'm maupe ogun yusuf sometime last week former presidential aspirant from professor kingsley mogalu and the minister of state for labor mr festus kamo san started off a conversation on population control i'd like you to listen to them we must establish a population policy in nigeria if we are to avoid a population bump and if we are to reap a demographic dividend. You can't discuss the future of the youth in this country without addressing what is bringing so many youth into the world. I don't think the solution is in cutting down our population, restricting our population explosion. However, I think the, the way to go is not to control population, but to scale up that population. Well, that question also got addressed on the social media last week, although this time it was sparked up by a different scenario amongst Twitter influencers. Someone apparently had asked someone else for money to the tune of 50,000 Naira to look after a maternity situation. And there was a question as to whether those who couldn't afford 50,000 Naira for maternity affairs should be given birth. That sparked some outrage, as you might expect. However, an opportunity to also look at the issues around poverty, population, and the birth control question also came up. Well, tonight, we bring that matter to hard copy. I speak with Obianuju Ikeocha, a pro-life advocate who has spoken very passionately on these matters. She is the founder Culture of Life Africa, an organization dedicated to defending the sanctity of human life, and the author of Target Africa, Ideological Neocolonialism in the 21st Century. Obenoju Ikeocha, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you for having me on your show. I don't know how many people have seen your book, but I want to believe that African governments should be interested in it. And if they are, you can tell us if you have, you know, what sort of reception it has had. Yes, yeah, so the book Target Africa was published last year, uh, but in the United States by an American publisher, Ignatius Press. Um, since it got published, I am glad to say it has got a fantastic uh, reception, but... My only sadness is that it's got a fantastic reception in Western countries. So people have read it in the United States, United Kingdom. Uh, people have read it in, in various parts of the EU. People have read it in Canada. I've taken it to the Canadian Parliament. Uh, I've taken it to the British House of Commons. I have taken it to many parliaments. But the problem is that nobody in Africa, or not many people in Africa, put it this way, would have seen it or would have read it or would have noticed it. Uh, I have only been to one African parliament with this book and that's the Ugandan parliament. Uh, it was good to be there. That was earlier this year. But as a Nigerian, of course, I am always a bit saddened that uh, at home, at m in my own home, uh, Target Africa has not yet been received as it should have. And it's probably because people don't know about it. It is interesting because you are speaking in defense of Africa yes. uh, on this. And you're talking about you know, how aid that comes to Africa, you know, seems to be coming with strings attached, so to speak, even though you have another documentary by that particular name, it's coming with strings attached and is attacking African values and um, beliefs, so to speak. But some will argue that the Africa which you speak for no longer exists. Well, H have you heard that? Absolutely. That, that sometimes does come up. And I would say this, uh, yes, there have been some changes in Africa, but the changes have been due to a form of westernization. It's not so much a change as the fact that per perhaps some younger people are absorbing um, a culture different than ours. It doesn't change what our culture has always been. Um, there is no real formality to change it. That is one. But also another thing is that uh, I find that speaking as a Nigerian, the, l the likelihood uh, or the possibility is that somebody is only speaking from what they see around them. You live in Abuja, you speak about what you see around you in your neighborhood. You live in Lagos, it's the same thing. But I always like Africans, and that's why this book is Target Africa, not Target Nigeria. Yeah. It's I, I need Africans to have a broader mindset. When you think Africa, yes, think of yourself and where you are right now, which is somewhere in Nigeria, perhaps. But also think of the woman who is living in a village outside Kigali in Rwanda. Think about the woman who is in Sierra Leone. You know, these are all Africans. Uh, think about people in Northern Africa, in Southern Africa. But it is true that Africa is, a mindset. is not a monolithic entity. Absolutely. So isn't. our cultures are as diverse as we are. Exactly. And as such, it wanted to be a little 
misrepresentative to say you're speaking for Africa. Even simplistic, but I still hang on to that Mopwe because I have traveled through different African countries. And yes, we do have different customs and cultures and traditions that make us different and diverse, but there are some common threads that I see still running through various countries, running through be it villages, cities, people as saying some things that are so similar that as what I would hear in my village. You, you know, I go somewhere in Uganda and someone is telling me something and I kind of laugh to myself because my auntie in, a, you know, in Imo state was, would tell me something similar. So even though, yes, we have customs and cultures that are certainly different and diverse. So I don't mean to, to make it too simplistic. Even in Nigeria, in different parts of Nigeria, we have different cultures and customs, but there are still the common threads that run through, um, you know, the relationship between parents and children, uh, the cultural expectations, you know, and, and the cultural values that are attached to motherhood, for example. An African loves to have children, you know, a woman who doesn't have a child in Uganda, uh, uh, you know, with, suffering with infertility is suffering in the same way as a woman who is suffering with infertility in Nigeria. So that is based on some root culture and customs that we all share in common. Some people are going to say that, yes, indeed, some parts of Western culture might, we might find offensive. I mean, we might find a yes. little, yeah, but some people will say that it flows. This is not exactly an idea to try and recolonize Africa. That some of the things that we have experienced as a result of some of the things that we have taken. So, for instance, with colonialism came education, That's came right. language, yes. came a number of other things came the, came the new beliefs that we now have. That's right. Uh, Christianity and, yes. and what have you, and the numerous yes. sects that have yes. come with Christianity. Uh, would, you, would you accept that as a result of the education and a number of the things that we now have, and maybe other developments, like globalization, for of instance, course, the internet yes. age, uh, these things have naturally come. This is not some idea by the West to try and recolonize Africa. But the, you know, data does not support that and the style in which it is being done. Yes, within societies and civilizations and communities, uh, there is some organic, let's call it an organic progression. So if you have education, so this then comes with it and that comes with it. Well, that does take a longer period of time. How things have progressed even within uh, Western cultures took centuries to get to where they are today but then that does not um, eliminate the fact that there is a, a sort of a concerted effort by some people some institutions within Western uh, countries to push quicker quicker especially on certain issues and not all issues but on certain issues uh, people and, and populations towards towards that so uh, you know for, for example legalized abortion everybody uh, believed that human life is, is sacred, human life is precious. Doctors were treating pregnant women as two patients just up until the late 1960s. The United Kingdom, once they legalized abortion, very quickly, within five or six years, it spread throughout uh, Western countries. That is not a natural progression. That is not an organic progression. That went very quickly. And there is some, uh, like a, a militant effort, as, as uh, Professor George said, militant effort. We see it happening. Uh, there are institutions, there are, you know, um, sort of uh, things put in place, policies put in place, and it's a certain push that cannot be denied. So yes, it is a recolonization. It is a recolonization when they bring it to Africa and they're pushing it much quicker. Well, you are now very famous for your famous letter <laughs> <laughs> to Melinda Gates uh, when she tried to raise, I think, about $5 billion for contraceptives in Africa. And I think uh, perhaps Asian countries Other as countries. Well. There were 69 yeah, countries. Yeah, 69 countries affected by that. I, I think that was sometime in 2012 or so. That's right. Yeah, yes. uh, she... she um, made that push and you you know wrote a famous letter to her said, telling her that that's not what um african women need and uh, you wrote what you thought african women would need instead and i think that has that's some rise in the edu in, in in what um, you know mr festus Keamo and uh, professor King, kingsley mogalu that summarized in the different patterns of thought uh, for both people. Yes. Um, now, some people are not going to dispute the fact that, I mean, you say, amidst all our African afflictions and difficulties, amidst all the social, economic, and political instabilities, our babies are always a symbol of firm hope, a promise of life, a reason to strive for the legacy of a bright future. Now, I'm not going to dispute this. 
but you say that many of the 69 targeted countries are Catholic countries with millions of Catholic women of childbearing age. These Catholic women have been rightly taught by the church that the contraceptive drug and device is inherently divisive. For you, you make no distinction between being Catholic and being African. Yes, but you must know, Mokwe, that this was the very first thing I did. This was the very, this, this I wrote seven years ago. And of course, at the point I was writing it, my mindset uh, was thinking about like some Latin American countries that are largely Catholic countries. And I was writing from that point of view. And when I wrote it, I did send it to a Catholic ministry. And that was really how, as they say, it went viral. But then this is, you know, seven years later, um, Let's just say that I even would speak from a broader point of view, because at the point I was, you know, thinking about Catholic women, thinking about the teachings of the church, uh, but I, I really don't speak from that point of view now. I am looking at data, I am looking at countries' policies, I am looking at cultures and customs, and how, for example, contraceptives that are being pushed on African nations, for example, and other developing countries, like in Latin America, wh what the outcome is, what, what, is the, what are the... Let's say the damage what happens in the path of of the of the donor who is sharing contraceptive and walking along let's come a year later and see what has happened your will i say um protest against contraceptives yes. can it really be defined from Af from an african perspective yes can it absolutely because it's the attitude with, that africans have towards families and having children that, yeah, absolutely. I speak from an African point of view. It's our attitude towards having children, towards large families, uh, towards, you know, how pregnant women are treated, how babies are welcomed. That is really within the DNA of African communities. One of the f Let's just make one thing clear. If a woman decides she wants to use contraception, my own argument is let her know, ex let, her be, let her have full an informed consent. Let her know exactly what it is that she's choosing. And if at the end of the day she decides she's going to use it, well, it is up to her. But my fight is with the donor who is bringing these things in and they are giving it prominence and they are prioritizing it over every other need that we have. So I am not going to tell married people, you know, you're using contraception, you're in the wrong. I mean, make your decisions, but let it be an educated decision, a full and informed, you know, consent, especially with pharmaceutical products. That's, that's what I'm saying. However, among married people, yes, I mean, men and women can decide how many children that they want to have. But with the knowledge that the woman's, uh, for, you know, um, it's sort of a fertility, having a fertility awareness, knowing how the woman's body works, it's not like uh, people can, can have babies with every sexual contact, but should, can men not settle down and discuss with their wives about fertility? It does improve marriage communications. It does improve the way, the, in many ways I have seen, the way men treat their wives in full, in consideration. Uh, but then somebody comes in and brings contraception. The message is that, well, it's to make your, your wife available to you all the time. There are other ways, Mokwe, and we know, we know that. Even now, academic work is progressing, medical academic work is progressing in such a way that things like natural family planning are being so um, developed in Western countries. Uh, even if it's not given prominence in, in media, people are not really talking about it, uh, but there are institutions in the United States, in the United Kingdom, where people who are not religious at all are coming from the point of view that we are now going organic. Uh, are these things good for the woman's body? For, you know, the, the question, should women be pumping these into their bodies if they don't have to? So we're taking drugs for heart disease, lung disease. Well, you do have to. But something like contraception will be uh, perhaps products that we can do without. And there are many resources right now in Western countries that are dealing with that and offering it to women. And these are health, much healthier options. Why is it that it's not good enough for the African? We'll take a moment now. When we come back, we'll wade deeply into the population question, especially with regards to Nigeria. Do stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. My guest tonight is Obianuju Ikeocha, a pro-life advocate. We've spoken very passionately on matters involving Western aid and population control in Africa. Now, let me ask you to wade into this conversation on population control in Nigeria. I yes. mean, in Africa, we've been told that we're going to be one of the largest one of the largest populations well in Nigeria, I think by 2050, the third most populous country in the world by 2050. And if we don't do something about it, if we don't ensure that our population is a source of wealth uh, rather than a source of conflict and worry and anxiety, you know, we could be sitting on a time bomb, literally. Where do you stand on that? I agree with, like, with the clip that you had shown at the beginning of the show, uh, of the debate. I totally agree with the Honorable Minister of State, uh, who was making the argument that population is not really the issue. And if you want to know uh, what could happen with demography, if you begin to unnaturally try to push for a, a population, uh, like a, a, you know, kind of de a depopulation of the people, look at what is happening in other countries. I know it's difficult to look away, but, but have a look at what is happening in countries where there have been a demographic winter, where you push the population so much that people are then having children below uh, the expected fertility rate, below replacement rate. It is always a problem. It is usually a very difficult problem. In some cases, almost irreversible. There are the, the only instance we can recall where yes. the population was pushed by some regulation is China. Talking about China, China pushed for population control in, in such a in, in such a, a harsh way, they did the one child policy in 1979. As of today, there is a terrible imbalance between the sexes. Because what then happened was that couples were deciding when, they, when a woman is pregnant, they do a scan. If it's a baby girl, baby girl is aborted. Because uh, they're only allowed to have one child. And they are having to kidnap women in some parts of China. As, as, you know, to, as, as brides, they are kidnapping brides, they are going to uh, neighboring countries to, to marry women. It's a difficult situation. So China is one example, yes. but Nigeria is a different scenario altogether, but where we have still? a question of children on the streets, children who are roaming the streets yes. and who are not being taken care of by their parents. Now there is a concerted effort on the part of government to try and tell people, have only what it is that you can look after. Right. What's wrong with that? Everybody knows that responsible parenthood is about couples discussing and having, having the children that they can take care of. But as the Honorable Minister of State had mentioned in his argument, the problem we are having, why all those children are on the streets, is a lack of education. Why don't we try first to uh, bring to us at least a basic level of education of the public and then people take decisions. If a girl is 16 years old and she's not in school and she mm -hmm. doesn't have access to education, what then happens is that she's available for marriage. We're talking child marriage. Mm -hmm. She gets married at 16. By the time she is 32, she may have had nine children. The problem is not, or, or the solution to the problem mm -hmm. is not coming to make sure she doesn't have the nine children. The problem is that she should not be ab available for marriage at 16 or 15. So what happens in that period where a woman is fertile or children have become fertile as a result of the fact that they are their teenage years yes. and uh, you know but cannot get married yet because some people will say that one of the reasons why people are allowed to get married on time is so that they can cure promiscuity so to speak. Hmm. Insists on responsibility is teaching that sex comes with responsibility. Some of the sex ed programs that are being brought especially from some western programs are not really targeted on, on teaching people about responsibility on teaching people about respect it is more about your sexual rights. So are we talking sexual responsibility or sexual rights? I want people to learn about sex and all that comes with it and that sex is actually good and sexual dignity of the person. But you also want them to learn the full responsibility that comes with human sexuality and people can be taught that way. Quick questions yes. for you. The first will bother on whether or not you got a response from Melinda Gates. Did you get a formal response from her? She didn't. And I'm hoping that one day I will get a response either from her or from the, the Bill and Melinda Gates family. Interesting is somebody who I also listen to uh, when she talks about feminism and she's also trying to approach it from a very African perspective. Um, Chimamanda right. Adichie. Have you read any of her works? Uh, do you I know of her, yes. I have seen some of her work. Do you agree with some of the 
points that she espouses when it concerns feminism and the fact that African women, I think largely when you talk about feminism yeah. and you talk about models of womanhood that you have followed, the models of womanhood that inspire you, yeah. largely, f you know, you seem to agree largely yes. you know, to, to a huge extent. Yes. However, at their point of departure. Absolutely. So we, we start from the point of, of womanhood to agree. Um, what is womanhood? The dignity of womanhood. Uh, I want to see the African woman rise into full stature. I want everybody who has a, a baby girl to celebrate as hard as if they had a baby boy. I want to see girls being sent to school in the same way that boys are being sent to school. So really that the two men and women are equal in dignity and worth. That is what I want to see. And we still have some work to do there. The fact also that African women kind of, and in other places, I suppose, they gravitate towards one another. We strengthen one another. So we have the Women Association of Teachers, the Women Association of Doctors, Women Association of Lawyers. We do that a lot in African countries. So women kind of gravitate towards the sisterhood and strengthen each other. We, we love being women. We are celebrating our womanhood. When you go into those gatherings, most of the time, because my mother has been part of that, you know, from the time I was growing up, um, it's, it's all about being a mother, being a wife, even sometimes being a professional. So they're teachers they are lawyers and, and all of that so that is amazing and I love that and that's what I see as the ideal feminism when a woman uh, stands in her own that proudly. has become easy that has yeah. taken some push that e has exactly. taken and some fight some militant fighting and as I, a matter of fact exactly but I do write that that we, we need that work done and it's good that we have done it but we've come to a certain point of departure which is then when you get to things um, like the second wave feminism where they are talking about abortion you know what, what should a woman uh, be able to do with her body and we're saying if it if a child in the womb is involved then it's not really like your but there's another human being there and that human being should be protected by law in every African country you separate African countries uh, the ones that have accepted abortion with conditions the yes. ones that have made abortions uh, made it available on demand and, yes. and so on and so forth are you saying that under no circumstance should a baby be aborted if, is it a human life? Who should be killed? Under what circumstances should any human being be killed? So in, in I think every African country, as far as I know, Egypt was an exception, but they too have joined that group, at least in every African country, for the life of the mother, for the life of the mother. Okay, I believe that and I agree with that. And I work in a medical field as well in the UK. And so I understand for the life of the mother. Beyond that, though, uh, you know, where they say, you know, for your emotional reasons, for um, health reasons, what they call health reasons, which can also be psychological health, for economic reasons, um, a woman should be able to abort a child. I don't believe that. If it's a human life, if a, a human being is involved, I think and I believe that every human being should be protected. What do you say to that argument about population control for the sake of the earth? I don't believe it because um, th some of those who are some of those who are coming as donors are also coming from the environmentalist point of view, where it's like, you know, let let's reduce the population. But if you're reducing the population, maybe not let's reduce. Let's not go as fast as we're going. So people are not saying yes, don't, but already don't in many countries. Have, no, in in many you know, countries, where we yeah. already have a crisis in the opposite direction. So are you talking about climate change? Are you talking about CO two emissions? So that's why they cannot talk about climate change with the African populations because if you look in the West, mm -hmm. each person is consuming so much more and releasing having so much more CO two emission than an average person in, in an African country. And I did uh, reflect that in my book when I talked about the population. That's why they can't point to somebody in Ethiopia and say, stop having children or reduce you know, the number of children you're having. But you look in the UK, one person is, is having uh, access to more water and using up more water in a day than even a whole family will use in Africa. So it's not a matter of resources because they're not making that argument for African countries. Mm. African countries are not having as much industrial waste. We are not having as much CO2 emission. We are not. And they know it. You, we have a problem with the quality of education that is being given to our population. And, and everybody knows that. And nobody, that, that should be without contest is, is the way how, um, 
how, how kids are raised, how the youth is equipped, how employable is every person by the time they are 20 or 25? What, what, what do we have on ground? And that's where the problem lies. Well, for us, it's a conversation that we hope will keep going. Uh, that is something that Nigeria will not shy away from, the question of population, exactly. the yes. question of aid yes. coming into Africa and yes. on what terms and conditions we're accepting it. We're and whether not asking or not questions. We're, we're scrutinizing very clearly to know mm. whether we're mortgaging our future while we collect this aid. But it's a conversation that we hope we will spark off. We have to thank you for coming you. on Hard Copy. Well, that's where we leave the program tonight. But we always look forward to your feedback and comments. Please use the handles showing on your screen. I'm Mao Poyo Good night.